Welcome back, class. We're going to jump in here on the second segment of chapter nine. And we're going to talk about the ag aggregate production function. We're going to talk about the market for labor. We're going to talk about the long run aggregate supply curve. The labor market is at equilibrium at the natural level of employment. And remember, the labor market, uh, if you go back to your micro classes, uh, when you're looking at the labor market on the, on the vertical axis, you're, you're plotting the real wage rate. On the horizontal axis, you're plotting the unemployment or the employment quantity per year. And at, at equilibrium, you've got the supply and demand curves that are being driven at equilibrium. Uh, and it, as uh, Adam Smith says, you've got the uh, market forces or the invisible hand driving this market for labor to equilibrium. And as the labor market goes to equilibrium, it impacts the production function, which in turn impacts the long run aggregate supply. Uh, and, it's, and as we said before, it's the economy's potential measure of output. And if you think about, if you think about, just step back and think about labor for, for a few minutes. Um, you're a laborer, I'm a laborer. I provide goods and services for a price. You provide goods and services for a price if you're employed, whether it's part-time or full-time. And it, the, the issue with labor, or at least the labor market, or the factor market for labor, depending on how you want to look at it, <clears throat> is divided uh, between two things, labor, leisure, punching a clock, being a couch potato. And it all depends on each individual's preferences. It depends on whether you as an individual can maximize your utility and what drives your maximization of that utility. Um, what, 24 hours in a day, seven days a week? Uh, you've only got so many hours uh, in any given day or so many hours in any given week or so many hours in any given year either work or be a couch potato. And it's going to be that wage rate that's going to determine your, re, your willingness to work or your, your desire to swap work hours for leisure hours. And again, it comes down, it's going to come down to the individual uh, consumer, the individual laborer. I have a certain level of utility that I Receive from from working. Um, I have a certain level of income that I like to uh, capitalize on from working. Do I enjoy leisure? Absolutely, but I enjoy making money uh, probably more so than I do leisure. Now, if I were to ask you that same question, you might flip it on me. You might enjoy leisure. You might enjoy watching daytime television, whatever people watch during the day on TV. I I don't know, but uh, there must be some TV shows, or or maybe you and you know enjoy you know playing video games or something. But every individual has an. And you remember, go back to your micro classes. You've got every individual has an indifference curve, and at that indifference curve, you're thinking about the indifference curve with the trade-off between working and leisure. Um, I don't know. It, it's going to depend on you as an individual as to how many hours that you spend working and how many hours that you spend being a couch potato, or how many hours you spend with your family, or how many hours you spend playing golf. Um, again, it's, it's personal preference. But wage rate is going to play a part in that uh, decision because at some point, the price of leisure is going to rise to a level that you will go back and work additional hours because it is uh, more beneficial for you and or your family to work those hours. And if you think about the equilibrium, so the equilibrium wage rate and the equilibrium quantity of labor for not only an individual, but for a market or for an economy is at equilibrium, somewhat set to, you you have an equality there. The natural labor, uh, the natural level of employment is going to be equal to the natural rate of unemployment. 
And when we talk about the, the natural rate of employment, there is no cyclical unemployment and there is a vacancy. There is a job opportunity waiting out there for everyone that is unemployed and that wants to work. So that is your, your, your natural level of employment. And when it's at equilibrium, that natural level of employment is equal to the natural rate of unemployment. So when you're, when you're thinking about how labor impacts that long run aggregate supply curve, think about changes in, you know, what's, what are the changes in that long run aggregate supply curve? Um, it's determined by the aggregate production function. It's also determined by the supply and demand curves for labor or the equilibrium in the labor market. That's going to drive, or that's going to be one of the drivers of changes in the long run aggregate supply curve. A shift in the aggregate supply curve or in the, or in the aggregate production function uh, can be an improvement in technology, uh, an increase in capital stock, an increase in the natural resources. Natural resources, talking about land. Um, you've got a um, you've got a mobile taco truck and it's driving around Nashville and you're doing really well with that taco truck. And then you sit down with, you know, maybe you sit down with your partner or your wife or your family, or, or maybe you just, you're, you're not married yet. You sit down with, uh, you know, one of your buddies or maybe even sit down with your parents. And you said, you know, I'm doing so well with this taco truck. I'm thinking about either buying another taco truck and, and have two of them running. Or I'm thinking about having a taco truck in a restaurant. Or I'm thinking about getting rid of the taco truck and just turning it into a restaurant and going into the restaurant business. And at that point, you're, you are trying to determine, um, and again, you're going to, you're, you are, for the most, end of, most rational individuals, uh, if you're a rational individual, you're going to be operating that taco truck for one reason and one reason only. And that's because you want to generate a profit. You want to generate a return on the investment. You want to make yourself wealthier. You know, what we talk about at the first, uh, economic growth makes us wealthier, makes us happier, makes us healthy, healthier. And at that point, um, you as an individual, maybe you as an entrepreneur, are trying to determine how you want to move that forward. Um, uh, and if you also, it, as the, as, as you increase capital stock, as you increase natural resources, and for the most part, it's land, maybe you want to build a new building, or if you have improvements in your technology, it's going to push that aggregate production function up and out. It's going to, to, to increase that production function, make you more successful. Um, think about you know, it's the local Starbucks or think about the doctor's office. Think of the opportunities of an individual firm that are trying to expand their aggregate production function. And they're trying to do it through capital stock, natural resources, improvement in technology, maybe even entrepreneurship or the entrepreneurial advantage or competitive advantage that they're trying to build on to help push that product, that aggregate production function out. And we've talked about it uh, when, we, when we were discussing uh, Starbucks or the doctor's office. At some point, you can continue to push that um, aggregate production function out by adding additional units of labor. But at some point, you hit that uh, you know, marginal, you start having a diminishing marginal returns. And when you have that diminishing marginal returns, at that point, um, you need to step back and take a look at your staffing process. And when we're talking about a shift in production function, labor is, is more productive um, for a couple of reasons. Each unit of labor produces more output. That makes sense, doesn't it? If you can expand that production function or shift that production function out, each unit of labor or the marginal uh, product of labor increases, and more labor will be more labor will be employed because as your marginal product of labor again going back to micro, 
as your marginal product of labor increases, you're going to bring on more employees. You're going to go through a hiring process because an increase in the marginal product of labor, you're going to just, you're going to be more productive as a unit. I managed my last, uh, I guess, senior type management position. I'm working as a consultant now. So uh, I'm managing projects more so than managing individuals. But my last opportunity to manage a team was um, in Buffalo, New York. And we had, had that was the you know corporate director of a, a payment integrity team. And, and I had analysts on that team and I had uh, clinicians on that team. Clinicians mostly were nurses. And if I'm looking at the clinician side of that team, I was constantly looking at the marginal product of labor. What can I do to improve the, the aggregate production function of those nurses? What could I do to help them improve efficiency? What could I do to help them be more productive at their job? And it is a constant ongoing struggle as a leader of a, of a team or as a um, leader of a firm or even as an entrepreneur, you're always trying to maximize that marginal product of labor because the more productive you are, the more output you can generate. And two effects of the shifts in the production function, you have more productive labor, which drives more output. You have more productive labor, which is more desirable to increase hiring practices. Because at some point, uh, that you know, the, the demand is going to start shifting in such a way that the natural level of unemployment increases. And at some point, you're going to set that equal to the natural rate of unemployment. And as you shift that aggregate demand out, what's it going to do to the real wage rate? It's going to increase that real wage rate. The more productive labor you have, the more hiring you're going to do. The more hiring you're going to do is increasing the demand for labor. The more that you demand labor, it's going to increase the natural wage rate. I mean, it, it goes back to the basics of supply and demand. Productivity, uh, and, and a lot of firms will, a lot of firms will calculate productivity, not so much in the marginal product of labor, they, but they calculate it in the average product of labor. And if you, again, you think about it in economic terms, if you think about the economic formula, average product of labor is nothing more than your output divided by the total number of units of labor you have. If you've got two Starbucks and they are selling um, the same number of units on a daily basis, they're generating the same number of cups of, of tea, they're selling the same number of muffins or sandwiches, they're selling, you know, the number of coffee, you know, woo-woo drink things that they, that they generate there. What you're going to have is you compare them side by side and you've got, so you've got the same productivity. One has five employees and one has four employees, which one's going to have the highest average production of labor or high, highest average product of labor. It's gonna be the one over here with four employees. Why? Denominator is smaller. Always remember, remember, go back to your basic math concepts. If the numerator is the same and the denominator is smaller on one as you know, when you're comparing it to another, the one with the smaller denominator is gonna be uh, the one with the higher average product of labor. If you know, just think about it. One fifth is less than one fourth. So if your numerator is the same and your denominator is different, one the smaller denominator is going to have the highest average product of labor. Shift in the long in the long run aggregate supply curve, um, and it you know it shifts it outward to the right. Again, you want you want that long run average supply curve to be shifting toward the right. Because as you're moving toward the right, what's happening? The real GDP is shifting. It's increasing. So you want that long run aggregate supply curve to be shifting to the right. And that can shift to the right because you're changing productivity. Remember, 
it's a vertical shift, changing productivity. You have a vertical shift in that aggregate production function. Also, you have a change in labor employed, moves it farther along the production function. So that's going to change, that's going to shift your long run aggregate supply curve outward to the right. It's going to increase the real GDP. Some firms, and it is, it is somewhat of a misnomer, but some firms believe that if you increase capital stock and you increase technology, you're going to drive down the demand for labor. You're going to drive down em employment. You're going to drive down the, will, the real wage. That's not necessarily true because as you increase your capital stock and as you increase technology and to some extent entrepreneurship, you're going to increase that margin. You, you tend to have a higher probability of increasing that marginal product of labor. And if you're increasing that marginal product of labor, it makes sense to bring on more individuals. I can give you an example. In Buffalo, payment integrity, group of clinicians. I brought on a vendor that sold a um, technology software type product that increased their productivity by 38%. I didn't lay I didn't lay nurses off. I went out and tried to hire more nurses because there was there was work to do. And if I could increase their productivity by 38%, I could bring on more nurses, train them, get them up to speed, have them use the same production function that the current nurses were using. And it was going to increase their I mean, it was a win-win for for me working in Buffalo to improve the capital stock, to increase the technology that we were using. And by bringing on new capital stock, by bringing on new technology, I was actually maximizing or getting closer to maximizing the human capital of those individuals working on that clinical team. So while increasing capital stock and increasing technology may cause um, some shifts in the demand for labor force, it is not, it's not a slam dunk that it's going to decrease the demand for labor, it's going to decrease employment, that it's going to decrease real wages. Because in bringing it on, if you're increasing that marginal product of labor, then it actually makes more sense to bring on labor as long as you have the workload to uh, allocate across those new individuals that you're bringing on board. That brings us back to, or that actually brings us forward to, if you listen to the talking heads on CNN, Fox Business, you know, Wall Street, Barron's, whomever you listen to for your business news, everybody's concerned about what AI is going to do. Do I know what AI is going to do? No. Do they know what it's going to do? Probably not. Um, I'm not sure really anybody knows. There may be a few people that have a pretty good idea, but I'm not sure it's etched in stone what AI is going to do with the labor force. But if it increases the marginal product of labor, it may actually increase the demand for labor in certain skill positions. Now, it may mean that some workers may have to be retrained, but or may have to be retrained to uh, be productive in new types of employment. But there's no guarantee it's going to be uh, that the, I mean, I hear talking heads talk about, oh, it's going to, you know, you know, going to eliminate the need for individuals to ever work again. You know, what are we going to do? And everybody's wringing their hands. I'm not sure anybody really knows what's going to happen. Now, you've got those individuals that are on social media bemoaning the fact, I mean, it's, I, I can't remember the, the terminology they're using to describe these individuals, but you see a lot of in, individuals on social media that are talking about they've just gotten out of college, uh, gotten their new degree, they've gone to work, and they just can't believe they're having to work a nine to five job. It's just, oh, you know, my God, it, this is this is the worst. I have to work nine to five. I can't go out and party. I can't, you know, cook. I'm too tired to cook dinner when I get home. You know, I, I can't go to the gym. I can't, I can't, I can't. 
Get used to it, people. Nine to five, be, be thankful you have a job. So what you're, what you're going to see moving forward, there are going to be changes in the labor force. How's that change in the labor force going to impact uh, aggregate demand? How's it going to impact the aggregate production function? What's it going to do to the long run aggregate supply function? Uh, we may still be uh, trying to figure that one out, but there will be an impact. Developing countries tend to invest more in capital stock, and it's called, if you remember reading it in your text, it's called catching up growth. Uh, cutting edge growth at some point, diminishing marginal returns kick in, and once this happens, let's start improving technology. So you, you, can, you can build capital stock up to a point, you can hire labor up to a point, so two factors of production, you can bring them up to a point, but at some point, it, it, it's some, it, there's going to be at some level, you're going to have to start to improve technology. You're gonna to have to have those entrepreneurial mindsets kick in so that you can increase and improve the efficiency of the production function. A change in labor supply can actually shift the long run aggregate supply function. Think about, you know, think about a change in labor supply. Immigration, we see hundreds of thousands coming across the southern border. Um, is that gonna push the long run aggregate supply function out to the right? Yet to be seen. Natural pace of population increase. Some countries um, have a, are actually seeing a decrease in in the natural growth rate of the population. Um, you've got participation, the distribution of the participation in the labor force. Um, went into McDonald's the other day and majority of the people working in the McDonald's I walked into are probably my age. They are well past there, but they would consider their optimal productive, you know, op optimal, you know, optimal productivity uh, but they either A, enjoy working, which I'm not sure they do, or B, they need the money. Because with inflation and, uh, and the price level that we're seeing in the United States today, you have a lot of seniors that are going back to work. They, they, are, they, they retired, they couldn't make it on their social security payments, or they've drained their 401k, their IRAs, their pension ran out. For whatever reason, they've gone back to work. So just, just start looking around as you go into Starbucks and McDonald's and other fast foods, go into Home Depot and Lowe's. Just go in there, go into Walmart, uh, go into Costco, Sam's Club, and just look around at the labor force. There is a, there, there is a, what appears to be a significant shift in the age of uh, individuals working in a lot of these types of, of of employment opportunities. The other thing that could change and um, you know push that long run aggregate supply curve out when we're talking about a change in labor supply is just the improvement in human capital. I can remember the first time that I talked about human capital to my team in Buffalo, they thought I was a complete nut job. You know, most of the individuals there hadn't had never heard of the term human capital, didn't know what I was talking about. Um, but as you start to explain it to them and you start to, to provide them um, additional opportunities to increase their expertise, then they start to understand the advantages of, of improving human capital. If you, can't, if you can't increase the physical number of laborers, to boost that marginal product of labor. You want to invest as, a, as an entity, as a firm, as an economy, you want to invest in improving the human capital of your workforce because that will significantly boost that marginal product of labor. Um, the other thing that they touched briefly in the text about, uh, you know, I was mentioning the age of the workforce, they're talking about just the sheer numbers of, of women that have moved back into the workforce. Um, and I'll just pick as an example, um, you, got the you have the nursing profession. 
but you know, if I were a an individual with a nursing degree at this you know particular point in time, you've got a golden opportunity. There is a shortage of nurses. There is, you know, they're pay, they, nurses are receiving wage rates that um, they probably never thought they would ever see. So, you know, if you're a nurse and you want to go back to work, uh, you have a, a great opportunity to go back to work and provide uh, the revenue flow or revenue stream for your family. If when you're talking about um, shifts in the supply curve for labor, what, you know, depending on what that supply curve shifts, it could drive down the real wage rate. Uh, and it could cause the natural level of employment to rise. The long run aggregate supply curve shifts because of an increase in the natural level of employment. You're bringing more individuals into the market. That wage rate, um, depending on how that supply curve is shifting, if it's shifting in a way that that wage rate starts to increase, individuals are going to start looking at the price of leisure and decide, well, you know, maybe I'll work these overtime hours. You know, I mean, heck, uh, you know, it's going to be Christmas weekend. And, you know, if I work Christmas weekend, I get time and a half. If I work Christmas day, I get double time, maybe. So depending on the wage rate and the price of leisure, it's going to determine and going to drive individuals on the decisions that they make regarding do they want to punch a clock or do they want to be a couch potato. Um, and again, the, the, the real wage rate is going to depend on the magnitude of the supply and demand shifts in that labor market. Um, and also it's going to depend on the number of people that are willing to uh, change their trade-off between punching a time clock and being a couch potato. We're gonna stop there for a few minutes. When we come back, we're gonna talk about the recipe for economic growth. Talk to everybody in a few minutes.